everybody, and um, I'm very delighted to see so many of you here this evening for our October event, which of course uh, is part of Black History Month. Now, this evening we are going to hear from a project called Woven Together Dundee, and we've got uh, the project coordinator and some of the volunteers from the project who will be telling you more about their research uh, particularly, again, into Dundee's connections to slavery. So, uh, without further ado, I would like to ask the project coordinator, Dr. Irina Adegbotelou, to tell you more about Woven Together. So, you're all um, welcome. Um, I'm sure some of us already aware of uh, what the Women Together project is all about, but for the benefit of everyone here today, um, the Women Together project is actually a community-based research project that aims to explore the history of Africans, Asians, and Caribbeans here in Dundee, and um, we've been able to you know, form a network of um, collaborations and partnerships with our volunteers, speakers, students, historians, community organizations in Dundee, faith groups, and many more organizations. And so I'll just then spend the next few minutes talking about what we do. So what do we do at Women Together? We are exploring the history of um, Africans, Caribbeans, and Asian people living in Dundee. We're giving, um, we're giving uh, the living people the opportunity to tell and the platform really to tell their own stories and uh, we're also using this opportunity to also um understand done these connections um, to slavery and its anti-slavery movement like i said we've been able to establish um, a network of collaborations and partnerships and um, within the project itself with our volunteers and um, speakers and the steering group um, for us, internally within the project, we go out to get stories from different people in our local community. Um, we also form partnerships with different organizations who tell us what they are doing, and then we transform all this into stories um, and different outputs, like oral histories, and we have some videos as well. Now, the vision is to take this information and put it into our website, which will be available for the public to actually have access to and read at any time. And then moving from there, we actually plan to have pop exhibitions um, coming up from time to time, and then community outreaches and then school outreaches. Our sponsors are the Abate Historical Society. Thank you again for hosting us today. And then um, the University of Dundee Museums. And we also have the Dundee City Council and then um, Alex Monker. Um, trust. So um, I've said it. I've said it already that um, we have volunteers who are on the project, and our hope today is that some of you would also join our team of um, over twenty volunteers at the moment. So we, some of us, go into the archives to um, dig out these hidden <laughs> treasures and stories that are embedded within our archives, and we. Um, Convert this into stories which you can read in the form of blog posts on our website. Some of us carry out interviews, some of us have gone out to um, carry out oral history and some video history. Some people are also involved in website management, proofreading, copywriting, and many more. So you can see a little bit of um, our output. Um, these are um, some volunteers who have come on board, and just a few um, pictures from some of the stories that we have already um, done. So this is basically the theme of our project. So we have about 15 themes for this project and it covers Dundee's connections to slavery, anti-slavery, um, stories about Africans, Caribbeans, South Asians, East Asians, notable visitors from the BIM, um, of BIM origin in Dundee, um, sports and culture, you know, um, community <coughs> and tackling racism, students, science, academia, many more. So for us at the Women Together Project, 
our hope really is that through our research and our stories that we actually inspire <coughs> different, you know, many generations to come with the outputs of our research for the common good of all. We also hope to uncover the hidden secrets of our existence and to foster love, unity, peace for a more prosperous and sustainable um, Dundee. I would just like to quickly close with a quote from one of the people that we have been you know, researching about, Frances Wright. And um, this, is, uh, this was a quote from her, which she says here, equality is the soul of liberty. And there is in fact no liberty without equality. So I hope you enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you very much. I would like to especially welcome um, Matthew Jaron. Matthew has been um, a very inspirational person to have been working with all this well, this project. Matthew, as you may already know, is General Secretary of the Abate Historical Society. He's also the creator of the University of Dundee Museums, and he's the chair of the Steering Group of the Women Together Project. So please join me as I welcome Matthew, Matthew, welcome. So thanks very much, uh, Irena. So if I think for a long time, people in Scotland were really quite reluctant to acknowledge their involvement in slavery. There's been a tendency, I think, to look at English cities like Bristol and Liverpool and assume that there were no Scottish equivalents. Eventually, Glasgow began to acknowledge the role that slavery played in the wealth generated by its tobacco merchants. And more recently, Edinburgh has started to recognize how many of its statues commemorate slave owners. Uh, even smaller towns like Montrose have, have begun to face up to the uncomfortable truths of their involvement in this industry. But Dundee, I think, has been slow to acknowledge just how much its people and institutions benefited from the slave trade. So the Woven Together project, a uh, new map that Erin and I have worked on, uh, and the other initiatives that are coming out from the City of Dundee Black History Working Group are, I think, long overdue. But it should really come as no surprise that Dundee was drawn into the transatlantic slave trade, as the town was already a major trading port. Uh, in 1698, the fraternity of seamen were among those who invested in a new <coughs> scheme called the Company of Scotland Trading to Africa and the Indies, which was awarded a monopoly of trade with Africa by an act of parliament. Uh, and this is the entry in the fraternity's accounts book, which mentions that they had a discussion about what part of the common stock of the fraternity should be laid out upon the African trades. It goes on to say that they decided to invest a hundred pounds, which was a no small sum in those days. Now, as it turned out, the company turned its attention westwards instead and became the ill-fated Darien Company. Uh, so it certainly wasn't one of the fraternity's most successful investments. <coughs> Now, following the Act of Union in 1707, the new UK Parliament intended to give the monopoly on African trade to the English Royal African Company, <laughs> which had been founded back in 1660. And Dundee merchants were among many in Scotland that petitioned against this, clearly still eager to make money from African countries. The town's growing linen industry gave it a valuable commodity to trade with. And there were a number of reasons why this trade took off. One was a chap called John Drummond. Now, he was the MP for the Perth boroughs, which included Dundee back then, uh, from 1727 to 1747. And he was a director of the Royal African Company. And it was apparently Drummond that encouraged them to use Scottish linen to clothe the slaves that the company transported. Now, the flax that was grown locally uh, in Angus produced coarse fibres that were best suited for low-quality uses such as sackcloth. So it tended to be uh, cheaper than other types of linen, and it was ideal for the slave trade. A further boost came in 1742, when the government introduced a bounty on exports of coarse linen. This allowed Scottish linen companies to compete with the many other makers elsewhere in Europe. Now, one of these was a place called Osnabrück in Saxony, which had been the main supplier uh, to the plantations. And it gave its name to a particular type of coarse fabric called the Osnaburg. Uh, which Dundee and Forfer both started making in large quantities. And this is a picture of uh, Solomon Northup, uh, best known as the author of 12 Years a Slave, wearing a typical Osnaburg suit. And also a detail from the Crawford map uh, of 1776 uh, showing uh, an Osnaburg works. 
Now, between uh, 1770s, uh, sorry, between the 1740s and the 1770s, textile production tripled. Uh, slave owners in the West Indies and the United States of America were among the main purchasers of that. And to give you a sense of just how significant this trade was, in 1823, the recently established Forfeiture Chamber of Commerce petitioned Parliament <coughs> to object to a reduction in sugar duties, stating, quote, the interests of the linen trade of this county are intimately connected with the prosperity of the West Indian planters, as your petitioners supply Osnabergs for the whole of their Negroes' clothing. So in other words, they were claiming that all of the clothes worn by the many thousands of enslaved people in the West Indies came from linen produced in Dundee and Angus. Now, obviously, that's an exaggeration, but it gives you a sense of just how significant this market was. Now, it's worth making clear that there are no known voyages directly from Dundee to Africa to transport enslaved people. But we do know that several left from nearby Montrose. However, in 1752, a ship registered in Dundee, the Hunter, sailed from London to Sierra Leone. There, it's recorded as having collected 105 slaves, only 85 of which made it to their destination in Barbados. The rest presumably died in the atrocious conditions that enslaved people were forced to endure on board ship. What we also know is that there were many sailings between Dundee and Jamaica in the 18th and early 19th centuries clear evidence of a direct trade in the produce of slavery. Now, as far as we know, these direct sailings began in 1753, when the dolphin, which you can see uh, mentioned on the bottom there, uh, sailed from Jamaica carrying linen for the plantations. Ships would generally return with other <coughs> goods. So, for example, in 1797, the Caledonian Mercury reported a brig called the Diamond, bound from Jamaica to Dundee, laden with coffee, <coughs> rum and sugar. And you can see some further examples here as well. Dundee established its first sugar house in 1767 on the corner of Seagate and St Mary's Wine, which of course is now called Sugar House Wine. Here, raw sugar imported mostly from the West Indies was refined and packed and then exported to various countries around the world. Now, as it turned out, the business was never very successful and the abolition of slavery in 1833 severely reduced the supply of sugar. There were attempts made to supply, uh, to source sugar from Spain instead, but those weren't enough to prevent the building closing by 1841. So who were Dundee's wealthy slave owners? Well, a good place to start looking uh, is the fantastic online research resource produced by the Centre for the Study uh, of Legacies of British Slavery um, at University College London. And this site aims to list every person who owned, inherited, or directly benefited from British-owned plantations in the Caribbean. But if you put Dundee into the search box, um, there are actually only six people that come up, including members of the Tulladeh and Ogilvy family that David's going to be speaking about later. Now, there are two reasons why this number is so small. One is that many of the wealthiest Dundonians live not in the town, but in large estates nearby. So we have to extend our search to parts of Perthshire and Forfarshire. Another reason is that some of our slave owners also had townhouses in Edinburgh or London that are often, and they're often listed under those addresses. So by extending our search, we can identify at least another 20 names. And I'm sure that there are others whose Dundee connections we've not yet managed to trace. Now, of course, it wasn't just the slave owners who came from Scotland. There was also a huge network of Scottish shipmen, overseers, doctors and lawyers working in the West Indies. Charles Campbell, a Highlander who worked as a bookkeeper in Jamaica in 1813-14, later wrote an account of his experiences there, which included a horrific depiction of an overseer who was known as the Dionysus of Dundee. And I should warn you, this is a really horrible story. On an estate called Paisley, this man ordered gunpowder to be rubbed into the open wounds of an old woman who had been whipped. He then lit a cigar and used it to set the gunpowder alight, burning the poor woman alive. Well, with so much wealth being generated as a result of slavery and so much trade taking place in the Caribbean, we can see that Dundee merchants had little interest in opposing the transatlantic slave trade. However, as abolitionist campaigns began to spread in the late 18th century, many began to question the morality of slavery. In 1788, when the first slave trade bill was being debated, the Lord Provost, magistrates and town council of Dundee, along with subscribing inhabitants of the said borough, were among several Scottish bodies who petitioned Parliament to object to the slave trade, claiming that its present state was contrary to the principles of justice, humanity, good policy and religion. Another petition from the Presbytery of Dundee followed in 1792. 
This one described the slave trade as utterly inconsistent with justice and equity and the most criminal traffic that ever disgraced the annals of the but, with, but many Dundee merchants were reluctant to abandon an industry that was bringing them so much wealth. In 1830, the Chamber of Commerce refused to support the abolition of slavery, claiming it was a moral issue out with their greed. It was not until 1832, a year before slavery was abolished, that the first anti-slavery society was formed in Dundee. And as you can see from this newspaper report, that was in response to a visit by two Baptist missionaries who had been in Jamaica and reported on the horrific conditions that they saw there. After abolition, the focus shifted to the US. Dundee merchants continued to profit by selling linen to American slave owners, while at the same time, anti-slavery campaigners waged an increasingly vocal campaign in the town. For the first time, previously enslaved people began to come to Dundee to speak to audiences directly about their experiences. Frederick Douglass is the most famous of these, but there were several others. Various local ministers, uh, most notably the Reverend George Gill Fillon, were at the forefront of these campaigns, while many of their wives were active members of the Dundee Ladies Anti-Slavery Association, formed in 1851. Their most high-profile event was a grand festival in honour of the writer Harriet Beecher Stowe, author of Uncle Tom's Cabin, the most popular novel of its time. But they also raised funds to support anti-slavery organisations in the US and to help fugitive slaves in Canada. So Dungey's associations with slavery were many and varied. A lot of people profited from it, and those profits eventually found their way into almost every institution in the town, including our schools, hospitals, museums, libraries, and universities. But there are also many who protested against it. And on the Woven Together blog, you can read stories about those, as well as about the various slave owners that our researchers are going to be speaking about tonight. So I'm going to stop there and hand over to our speaker. So thank you very much. Much, uh, Marcy, for shedding light there on, on that presentation. So we have an, um, another presenter just now, Laura Mulgrave, um, who is going to be giving us another presentation and then on that as well. Um, now retired Laura was a speech and language therapist in NHS. Uh, she's retrained and then she went on to become the head of the department for Scofield Dreams specific learning differences. She's had a long-standing interest in researching her family tree ever since discovering that there were some hidden family secrets. You're welcome, Laura. I just wanted to say, first of all, that the reason I became a volunteer for Woven Together um, was I felt I really wanted to learn more about this area of history. I have no particular qualifications in fact, the last time I studied history was for my highest. <laughs> um, I have no experience of research skills either, only what has been self-taught through doing my family tree. The challenges of lockdown meant all research was carried out online until more recently <coughs> those libraries and search rooms opened up. The staff at the local history centre were extremely helpful in sourcing newspaper articles and other resources. Such an important area that has in many ways been overlooked, but I would urge anybody interested to join us. If you can, if I can do it, then so can you. The first family I looked at was the Kinlochs. Probably everyone is aware of the statue of George Kinloch, the MP in Dundee. The family have a strong association with Dundee. Um, George Kinloch, the there, the MP, his fourth great grandfather, William, was one of a number of Dundee Burgesses in the family, and his third great grandfather, Dr. David Kinloch, was a physician to King James. He also <coughs> lived in Dundee and was buried in the Howth Cemetery. He owned land next to Greyfriars, which became known as Kinloch's Meadow. And it seems appropriate that the statue of George Kinloch MP, which was erected in 1872 in Albert Square, is on that land. So the connection with Jamaica seems to start with John Kinloch. He emigrated to Jamaica in 1747, 
and acted as an attorney to a number of plantation owners, managing their interests in their absence. This shows the estates that um, he was managing. And I've tried to give today's values too, in order to help us see the scale of their wealth. He then purchased his own plantation, the Grange, in Westmoreland, Jamaica. And when he died, he left his estate to his brother, George Oliver. Now, John did have three mixed race children in, in Jamaica, but there's no record of their names, or, there's no, or their mother's name, or whether they benefited from his will too. to George Oliphant Kinlog. He travelled to Jamaica in 1770, presumably to take control of his inheritance. It's not clear how often he was to Jamaica, but he was there in 1747, as John Wedderburn mentions that he was about to board a ship back and would be taking letters to the Wedderburn family. He died five years later. And the plantation remained as an asset in the Kinloch estate until the younger George inherited it on his coming of age in 1795. He then sold it in 1804 to another member of the Wedderburn family. They were all very closely intimate. So if we now look at uh, George Wedderburn, sorry, George Kinloch. He certainly didn't have an easy early life, but his experiences may have led him on the path to becoming radical in his political views. He held views not expected at that time of a wealthy landowner, and he would become known as the radical laird. He was born in Dundee in 1775. His father died six months after his birth. His mother died seven years later from TB. Although his mother had remarried, George and his older brother John were placed in the care of their mother's sister until she died five years later, also from TB. In 1788, they were sent to France with a tutor. The move was hoped to benefit John, who suffered from ill health but unfortunately he died in 1789. During the time in France, George would have been aware of the conditions which led to the French Revolution, which may have influenced his ideas on society. So at his coming of age in 1795, George inherited the Grange plantation from his father's estate. And he would have benefited from its income for nine years until he sold it in 1804. Around the time of the sale, the Grange had 189 slaves. George advocated political reform, hoping for universal suffrage for men and secret ballots. His political views were seen as treasonous, and in 1819, he risked deportation, but he escaped to France eventually being granted a pardon in 1822. By 1831, he put himself forward as a prospective candidate for Dundee. He put the abolition of slavery as his first election promise in his speech to the electorate of Dundee. It was, however, a gradual abolition as he felt that to move too quickly would create insurmountable opposition. The Slavery Abolition Act of 1833 notionally gave a change from slavery to apprenticeship. It didn't come into effect until 1834, and slavery was not fully abolished until 1838. So finally, I found that doing research can be rewarding and challenging and emotional. 
At times, you find what you are looking for, but at times you don't. <clears throat> and then sometimes, while looking for something, you come across the unexpected. While trying to find some information about a slave, I came across <coughs> Glasgow University's database on adverts on runaway slaves and slaves for sale. <coughs> and there on the first page of the document was this. <coughs> Read a bit. Try to get an image of this young man. Oh, this slave called London. See the silver watch. Do you see his face? Do you see a very expensive set of clothes? Well, that might tell you about the most valued possessions. Remember that whether he did or he didn't steal the watch, <clears throat> what's he for running away from his deportation back to the West Indies? So who would take that risk unless they had to? Um, insightful presentation. Um, we have another speaker now, David May. David initially studied history at Bristol University. Not a long time ago. <laughs> 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 That's what I'm going on to obtain a diploma in criminology at Cambridge University, then moving to Aberdeen University to do a PhD in delinquency and juvenile justice. After a year teaching in the United States, he came back to Dundee in 1978, working with the Department of Psychiatry where he taught medical students and later social work students. His main research area prior to his retirement was sociology of learning disability. So um, where he got to <coughs> get to learn, and learn more about him. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, uh, good evening. I'm very grateful to you, Rainer and uh, um, Matthew for inviting me to make this contribution to this important event. But I should point out, I, I, I come to this not, not from a black history perspective, but really from an interest in family history or the history of a particular uh, family. Um, I, I'm not previously a, a, a participant in the Woven Together project. This is my first introduction to the project. But I hope I, I will have something to say that will be of interest and, and relevance. Um, um, so John Ogilvy, Walter Tullydurf, and the Antigua Connection. I first encountered the Ogilvy's of Invercarity when I was asked some time ago to write a history of Strathmartin Hospital um, as part of a wider oral history project. Strathmartin had its origins in the Baldovin Asylum for the treatment of imbecile and idiot children. And it was founded in 1855 by Sir John Ogilvy, the ninth baronet of Nova Scotia, and his second wife, Lady Jane Ogilvy. It was the first institution of its kind in Scotland and one of the very first in the world. Sir so John was a, a, a notable Dundee citizen, a lifetime supporter of good causes. He was described as a, an aristocratic Whig of the better sort. Um, <laughs> he was a he represented Dundee in Parliament for 16 years in the middle of the 19th century. He was a convener and vice lieutenant of the county, chairman of both the harbour and prison boards, active campaigner for the new DRI. And the fact is, I think there's a ward named after him in, in, in the old DRI. It's now gone down. 
Um, and as well as uh, president of that institution, the lunatic asylum and industrial schools. A leading Freemason who gifted land um, to the city for public use. When he died in March 1890 at the age of 87, after a lifetime of public service, the many obituaries of him were fulsome, including one from Dundee's own poet, William McGonagall, <laughs> who described him as a Christian gentleman in every degree. <laughs> All mentioned his many achievements as a philanthropist and public benefactor. None, however, referred to his past as an owner of slaves, or the fact that when he inherited the baronetcy in 1823, he acquired extensive slave work sugar plantations on the island of Antigua. These had been passed down to him by his grandfather, the fifth baronet, another Sir, Sir John, who in turn had acquired them following his marriage to, in June 1754 to Charlotte, the elder of the two daughters of Walter Tullidaf of Baldoven and Bal Balgay. Of Charlotte. This is when she was 15 years old, two years before her marriage. This marriage, on the face of it, was an unlikely match. Sir John, the descendant of a long established family of Angus landowners who could trace their ancestry back to the early 14th century and beyond. He was, he was Episcopalian in religion and had barely concealed Jacobite sympathies. Walter Tullidaf, on the other hand, came from a long line of dissenting ministers in the Scottish Kirk who had suffered for their beliefs. He was the second surviving son of the Reverend, very Reverend John Tullidaf, minister of Dunbarney in Perth. His older brother Thomas followed his father into the church and later became professor of divinity at St Andrews and subsequently moderator of the General Assembly and first principal of the United College of St. Salvador and St. Leonard, which he was instrumental in founding. Walter, on the other hand, at age 16, was apprenticed to a surgeon in Edinburgh and later went on to obtain a medical degree uh, from the university. He subsequently spent some time in France and London completing his medical education before in 1726 going out to Antigua at the at the invitation of his cousin, Walter Sidsurf, who owned sugar plantations there and was a prominent member of the island's plantocracy. On first arriving uh, um, on the island, Walter practiced medicine, ministering to whites and blacks alike, but primarily the latter on a contract basis and using his family connections to augment his income by working as a factor and as an attorney for a number of absentee landlord owners, overseeing the operation of their estates and general business interests, and engaging in trade on his own account with contacts across the Caribbean, North America, Europe, and Great Britain. In 1736, his fortunes took a decided upturn Writing to his brother Thomas, he informed him, informed him that I was married January 19th last to an agreeable young widow by whom I have got possession of a very fine estate <laughs> <laughs> to which I am making additions and improvements. That's how you get on in life. You know, look out for a nice lady. <laughs> the agreeable young widow in question was Mary Tremels, um, near Burroughs. Mary's late husband had gone bankrupt, and his estate was acquired by Mary's mother, one Lucy Thibault, a member of a long-established and well-connected island family, who on her daughter's marriage to Walter, gifted him the, the estate. In all of this, Walter was following in the footsteps of a great many other enterprising young Scots, quick to seize the opportunities afforded them by the 1707 Act of Union, and lured to the West Indies, in particular by the pro prospect of making their fortune. Where in the world, said Edmund and William Burke in 1757, could great fortunes be made so quickly? 
They came as attorneys, bookkeepers, estate managers, overseers, and doctors. The men who serviced the estates on behalf of the largely absentee landowners and who were so essential to the smooth running and commercial success of the island's economy. Northeast Scotland contributed significantly to their number. But the opportunities came at a cost. A hostile environment, debilitating climate, tropical diseases, the ever-present threat from devastating hurricanes and foreign invasion, and an economy that rested on the exploitation of an unwilling enslaved labor force. This last was the white settlers' greatest fear. They lived in a perpetual state of collective paranoia, haunted by the ever-present threat of a slave rebellion. In early 1736, just as Walter was contemplating the twin challenges of marriage and plantation ownership, islanders were confronted by what they had long feared, a widespread conspiracy to murder the island's leading citizens and release the slaves from their servitude. The plot was discovered before it could come to fruition and was met with appalling, if all too typical, brutality. This is from the Gentleman's Magazine. At last about noon, King Court, the rebel leader, was broke on the wheel, a particularly horrible way of of dying, as were Tomboy and Hercules' lieutenants. Four more were burnt the same day in Otto's pasture, and tomorrow will be seven more, and so many as they can find leading men in this plot. Six were hung in chains upon gibbets and starved to death, of whom one lived nine nights and eight days without any sustenance. Their heads then cut off and fixed on poles, and their bodies burned. And 58 were several times chained to stakes and burned, and above 130 remained in prison. Apparently not particularly disconcerted or put out by these events, Walter flourished. Over the next 20 years, he steadily expanded his newly acquired plantation, increasing its size from 127 to 571 acres and and the number of his slaves from 63 to 247. By the time he left the island in 1757 for semi-retirement, he had become one of the island's richest and most respected men, worth a net um, fortune of 30,000 pounds, which is quite a sum in those days. The social equal of the island's first families, elected to the island's assembly in 1748, and six years later called up to the council, the island's legislative body. So he was quite a man in Antigua at the time when he left. In 1757, Walter returned to the Northeast, and apart from a brief return to the island in the mid-1760s, continued to manage his business as an absentee landlord until his death in around 1774. On his return to Scotland, he purchased two estates. In 1758, Balgay, and in 1759, Baldovin. On his death, the first of these, the Baldovin estates, or the second on the left, sorry, Baldovin estate passed to his daughter Charlotte, and she and her husband moved into Tullydeff Hall, which Walter had called the, the mansion that he inherited, which was later renamed Baldovin House leading Sir John and to sell his in the quality estates and to sever the family links with the area. So they moved into them then. In addition to Baldovin, Walter also left his Antiguan estates to Charlotte, his only surviving child, which effectively meant the property passing into the hands of the Ogilvy family. Although they did not come into legal possession of it until Walter's will was entered into probate in 1794. The Ogilvy, so far as, as I've been able to ascertain, left no papers relating to the Antiguan estates. So we have little idea as to how they conducted themselves or how directly they were involved in their management. This is a major obstacle to any attempt to reconstruct their involvement and any attempt to 
do so of necessity rests more on speculation than on hard evidence. Wanted, on the other hand, left a three-volume letter book that provides a record of his personal and business affairs, but the entries end in 1767, shortly after he retired and then mm -hmm. left the island for good. And some years before the, the Ogilvies assumed management of the estates. The books were initially left in the possession of the Ogilvie family, but only the first volume, covering the period 1733 to 45, now held by the National Records of Scotland, has found its way into the public domain. The present whereabouts of the other two volumes is unclear. Here, Oliver, Langford Oliver, in his history of, the, of Antigua, um, had access to and quotes from all three volumes, but the extracts he provides are so truncated and lacking in context as to leave much obscure. Richard Sheridan, a more recent historian of Antigua's sugar economy, in his Sugar and Slavery, 1623 to 1775, which was published in, 70, in 1974, quotes extensively from the letter books, but he is concerned with Tullinef's business interests and has little or nothing to say about his involvement with the Ogilvy's. So John seems to have gone out to Antigua shortly after Walter's death, and for some time he served on the island's council, but he had left by 1794 at the latest, not to return. It would seem that he left the management of his estates to his sons, at least until tragedy struck in 1799, when Adam, Sir John's youngest son, was murdered by his slaves. As was the all too common practice among white owners and managers, Adam had taken one of his female slaves as his mistress, a relationship that is unlikely to have been entirely consensual. She, however, had another lover, a house slave named Martin, and he, resentful and angry, plotted with others to end Adam's life. So late on the night of the 29th of July, 1799, when Adam was in a drunken stupor, they stole into his bedchamber to carry out their deed. And the anonymous reporter of the incident describes the affair in graphic, if somewhat melodramatic, terms. Pinioned by his murderers, Mr. Ogilvy's struggles became fainter and fainter. His sighs burst thicker from his lips. The blood gushed in torrents to his head and face as his deadly enemies pressed more tightly the heaving throat. His bloodshot eyes started from their sockets, and with one sharp pang, one choking frenzied cry, his spirit winged its flight to another sphere, <laughs> and his body sank on the pillow, a blackened corpse. <laughs> what followed had an almost comic touch to it. When the body was discovered, stiff and cold, the following morning, the coroner was sent for, the task of fetching him, however, from the other side of the island was unwittingly interested to Martin, who had in every reason for delay. <coughs> it was next day before they returned to find the body. In such a decomposed state, it was not possible to ascertain the cause of death. So a formal verdict of died by the visitation of God was returned. <laughs> <laughs> But the story does not end there. Uh, uh, there was to be a most unexpected coda. Three years later, the same conspirators plotted to murder the new estate manager, but were apprehended in the act, and following interrogation, confessed to their part in the earlier murder of Adam Ogilvy. Sir John, who died in 1802, would not have known the true circumstances uh, in which his son met his death. In the absence of any personal papers of the impropriety of Ogilvy's, it's difficult to get a sense of how the murder of Adam affected the family, and in particular, their attitude to their, to their plantations. Given that Charlotte held a life rent on the property, their ability to act was both legally and morally <laughs> circumscribed. Walter had left her a life rent in his will. In any event, they held onto the estates and continued to profit from them for a further 30-odd years. And it was left to Sir John, the ninth baronet, 
1832, almost 10 years after he came into the title to divest the family of the property, selling the, to the Jeffersons of Whitehaven who held a mortgage on the property. This prompts two questions. First question, what was the importance of the antiquities possessions to the Overleys? Secondly, what prompted Sir John to sell just months before the, the passing of the Abolition Act? He sold in 1832, the Act came, uh, was passed in 1833. Thus forfeiting more than £7,000 he would have received in government compensation. Or perhaps to put the question the other way around, why did Sir John not sell the plantation earlier when he first took possession of it? It's a puzzle that I don't have an answer to. I can only sort of speculate. A clue to the first question is perhaps provided by Sir John's two marriages. His first wife was Lady Juliana Barbara Howard, youngest daughter of Lord Henry Howard Molyneux Howard, the second son of Henry Howard and Juliana Molyneux. His older brother was Bernard Edward Howard, 12th Duke of Norfolk and 7th Earl Marshal of England. His second wife was Lady Jane Elizabeth Howard. Not, not, not a close relationship, but they're in this great Howard family somewhere. Um, she was the daughter of Thomas Howard, the 16th Earl of Suffolk, and Elizabeth Dutton, daughter of James Dutton, 1st Baron Sherborne. But a family no doubt powerful and influential enough in its own small fiefdom of northeast Scotland, these marriages represented a significant step up into the heart of the British establishment. And it's not implausible to think that the wealth that accrued to the Ogilvies from their plantations, from their sugar estates, was a significant factor in facilitating this round. As regards the second question, the answer is more complicated. The depression that followed the end of the French wars, ex exacerbated by soil depletion, reduced yields, increased costs, declining profits, had seen the value of the sugar states fall significantly. The added threat of abolition at the time introduced further concerns. The attractions of plantation ownership were no longer what they had been. Nor was the power, once powerful West Indian lobby the political force it had been. Following American independence, British uh, had less control of the Caribbean and less interest in, 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 in the area. In addition, the emerging industrial revolution in the home country saw the rise of the manufacturing interest, both in the in the economy and in politics, to which government had perforce to pay increasing attention. This manifested itself in the successful campaign for parliamentary reform, which shared a common constituency with the campaign for the abolition of slavery. The links are quite clear. 7th of June, 1832, the passing of the Great Reform Act. 29th of January, meeting of the first the first meeting of the Reform Parliament, 28th of August, 1833, abolition of slavery. There's a clear link between these activities. But on the other hand, given Sir John's character and the evidence of his subsequent career, it would seem unlikely that he was motivated entirely by economic and geopolitical uh, considerations. By the early 19th century, public opinion, led by a crusading coalition of evangelicals and Quakers, that had been turned decidedly against slavery and the slave trade. And these were the social and political circles in which Sir John now moved. His son, Reginald, for example, married into the Kinnaird family, neighbours of the Ogilvies and prominent evangelicals. But against this, there were other family interests and connections pulling him in a different direction, or perhaps pulling him in a different direction. I'm not speculating here. Juliana's maternal grandfather was Edward Long, a historian of Jamaica and member of the powerful Long Beckford Palmer clan, whose enormous wealth and position 
from their, derived from their extensive Jamaica, Jamaican sugar plantation. Long was a pro-slavery advocate and a virulent racist who regarded enslaved Africans as subhuman and an inferior species. He thought slavery actually benefited blacks. It instilled discipline into their lives. It was good for them. And he was ever ready to defend the interests of the plantocracy, which he did in his many publications. On the other hand, we shouldn't assume guilt by association. Um, both Sir John's wife's grandparents had died long before they married, and there is no evidence that either he or she shared their views on slavery, the slave trade, or anything else. It's also worth noting that Juliana's father had in 1796 voted for the abolition of slavery, and her brother Henry Howard, who at the time of the marriage was the head of the family, had twice in 1831 in the unreformed parliament presented anti-slavery petitions. So there was competing uh, polls at, 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 at Sir John at the time. Now all this may be regarded as background factors influencing Sir John's decision to get out of plantation ownership, although it's not clear what weight to assign to them. What may have proved decisive, provided the tipping point, was the serious unrest that spread throughout the, the West Indies um, prior to abolition. Fueled in great part, ironically, by the talk of emancipation and a feeling that the government was dragging its feet, wasn't getting on quickly enough with passing the act. Barbados in 1816, Demerara in 1823, Jamaica in 1831, and then closer to home, Antigua, Christmas 1831. All saw serious slave rebellions, which were suppressed with the usual barbarity. The sale of the Ogilvy's Antiguan estates was conducted not six months later. Well, I'm sort of suggesting there may be a link there, but I'm only speculating. I don't have any evidence at all, but not any hard evidence. Thank you very much. family tree, it's not too complicated, but there just were so many of the Wedmans and their relations involved um, that I, I thought it was important to see it. So the ones that are in the, the, the paler colour <coughs> are the ones who we know have direct contact with John. So if we start with Sir John Wedman of Bandy. He was the eldest surviving son of Sir John Wedderburn, the fifth baronet of Black Ness. <coughs> um, it's likely that he was born at the family home, Black Ness Manor House, in 1729. The house no longer exists, but was sited in what is now Abbotsford Street between Black Ness Road and Black Ness Street. John and his father had joined Lord Ogle. Ogilvy's regiment and fought at Culloden. He was only 16 years old and held the rank of cornet and would have been the standard bearer. Put into hiding in London whilst his father was imprisoned um, for treason and then fled the country after his father's execution. He would have been hung, drawn, and quartered. He eventually made his way to Jamaica. Three brothers, Peter, Alexander, and James, joined him there. Um, his sisters and the youngest son stayed in Dundee with the mother. In Jamaica, both John and James styled themselves as surgeons. There have been many surgeons in the Wedderland family, 
but it's not clear whether they were actually qualified. Neither Alexander nor Peter seems to have owned plantations, and Peter, it turned out, was a millwright. In 1752, John inherited a legacy from a great uncle and used it to purchase land and slaves. And these are all the plantations that were associated with them. And you can see how large some of these were. So moving through the Wedderburn family, let's have a look at his brother. James Wedderburn. Now, James was born in Dundee in August 1730. He was the second oldest son of John Wedderburn, fifth baronet of Blackness, and he co-owned a number of plantations with his brother John. And ultimately, ownership was inherited by their sons. During his time in Jamaica, James is thought to have fathered children with some of his female slaves. None of these were recognised in his will. His illegitimate son, Robert, wrote about his father. He adopted the medical <coughs> profession. And in Jamaica, he was doctor and man midwife and turned an honest penny by drugging and physicking the poor blacks. Where those that were cured he had the credit for. And for those he killed, the fault was laid to their own obstinacy. <clears throat> but by the slave Rosanna was born in 1762 and had been recognised as free by the people who purchased the pregnant Rosanna from Wedderburn. Living in London in 1824, he wrote The Horrors of Slavery, detailing the abuse his mother had received from James. This account was sent to William Wilberforce and it became influential in the fight against slavery. It was denied by his half-brother Andrew, but accepted by his other half-brother Peter. So if we move on now to John Redburn's son, we have Sir David Redburn, who was first baronet of Bandy. When his father died in 1803, Sir David inherited Ballandine and his father's properties in Jamaica. He is named as joint owner of the Blue Castle, Glen Islay, and Blackheath plantations, along with his cousin, Andrew Wedderburn Coburn. He became interested in politics and was elected Tory MP for the Perth boroughs, which included Dundee. He served as MP from 1805 mm -hmm until he retired from politics in 1818. He was viewed as adverse to the abolition of the slave trade and voted in 1807 for its postponement for five years. And in 1813, he was granted the freedom of Dundee. In the end, however, following a 30-year lawsuit with another of the Wedderburn family, and with the abolition of slavery, the family business was ruined and Valentine was sold. Now have a look at Henry Scrimger Wedderburn, first cousin of Sir John Wedderburn. In 1773, he joined his Wedderburn cousins who were now well established in Jamaica as planters, attorneys, and traders, and he owned the Bulk Plantation in Westmoreland in 1795 to 1807. There's little information about this estate other than its crops were sugar, rum, and some cattle. It doesn't appear on the government's 1804 inventory, but may have been amalgamated into another um, estate. During his time in Jamaica, he was also a member the House of Assembly. He eventually returned to Scotland around 1790 with his plantation continuing 
to be managed by the Wedderburn Company on his behalf. So, no mention of Sir John Wedderburn can ignore the slave Joseph Knight. He returned to Scotland in 1768. He brought with him a slave, Joseph Knight, who he had purchased in 1762 when Knight was about 13 years old. Knight origina originated from Guinea, but his real name was never known. He was, in fact, named after the ship's captain of the ship that brought him to Jamaica. He was used as a house servant, and Wedderburn taught him to read and write. So once back at Ballandine, Joseph fell in love with a servant, Anne Thompson, who was from Dundee, and asked for permission to marry her. They had at least one child together, but Sir John refused to allow them to live together as a family. Anne was sacked from the Wedderburn household after their marriage. So then when Knight left his service, believing that he had a right to do so in 1773 to work in Dundee, Sir John had him arrested. This then started a trail of court appearances. Um, he was brought before the justice, justices of the peace in Perth, who determined he should return. But no surprise, there were three justices of the peace, all of them were plantation owners, and one of them was George Ollivant Pinnock. So then, in 1774, Knight brought a claim before the Justices of the Peace, but Wedderburn won again. Knight then appealed to the Sheriff of Perth, and this time, the Sheriff found in his favour. Wedderburn appealed to the Court of Session in Edinburgh. He argued that Knight owed him perpetual service, and that he could have him forcibly returned to Jamaica. But I think what's often forgotten is just how long this took. The Court of Session in Edinburgh finally upheld the Sheriff's decision, but it took four years and three months from his first arrest to gain his freedom. And all through that time, he had to remain in the service of John Wedderburn. Lord Ockenleck stated, is a man a slave because he is black? No, he is our brother, and he is a man, although not our brother. He is in a land of liberty with his wife and child. Let him remain there. <coughs> This is a, a commentary from the Caledonian Mercury on Saturday the 17th of January, very shortly after this decision was made in the Court of Session. And it shows the view of the press following the trial, taking a very positive view of Joseph Swin. Um, I think the sad thing there is that they seem to be all fired up about the concept of the slaves having their freedom. But did that lose its impetus? And that's where Joseph's story ends. No one knows what happened to him. He may have returned to Dundee, he may have moved down to England, who knows. John, however, continued to advocate for the rights of plantation and slave owners. And I think this made him more determined than ever to look out for their rights. <laughs> Thank 
thank you very much to all of our speakers this evening. So I think, yeah, we will draw, draw things to a close uh, for this evening now. And yeah, if you haven't already picked up a copy of Breaking the Chains, please do so on your way out.